So I chopped the chicken's head off and, and threw it out in the audience. And everybody was terrified of that chicken head. They just like, whoa. My name is John Doran and I write about music. In this series of short films for Noisy, I've been talking to outliers, mavericks and true giants in the field of British popular music, such as Jimmy Page, Viv Albertine and Noel Gallagher. Today, I meet John Cale, who was born in South Wales in 1942. After studying music at Goldsmiths, he moved to New York in 1963. The following year, he went on to found one of the greatest rock bands of all time with Lou Reed, The Velvet Underground. After leaving the group, Cale went on to record a large and challenging body of solo work. And now, a few weeks from his 74th birthday, he has returned with one of his most radical and enjoyable albums to date, M Fans. So diving straight in with it, I wanted to know, why was it time not only to revisit your classic Music for a New Society album, but to completely rework it as M Fans? Well, it, it had taken a while to figure out the best way to re-release it. I mean, it hadn't been out for a while. And then somebody in Aarhus said, hey, we got a festival and we're devoting it to, each artist will do one album in its entirety, as is. So I went there and did, did a live performance, checked out a few different ideas on, on arrangements, string quartets or whatever, and then went back to LA and got in the studio and started work. And, and it, it veered uh, straight away into more techno side of things. And I was very happy with that. I mean, I've always tried to, to have a really good thumping 808 in, in, in any arrangement I do. be said that M Fans is a very, very modern sounding record. I mean, to my ears, it bears some of the hallmarks of modern electronic R&B, minimal techno and current hip hop. Is this, to your mind, a risky strategy, given that, you know, being polite about it, you are an artist who's in his kind of sixth decade of releasing music? I, I, I don't quite understand why that would follow. I mean, I get bored very easily with the same thing. I started off in the avant-garde, so I, I kind of like tearing things up. Is, is hip-hop still an influence on you? I know it's been a great influence on, on you over the last few decades. Yeah, I mean, I, I listen to a lot of hip-hop because that's, that's where the standards in production went. You know, if you want to find out where, you know, where the high standards of production are, you go to Dre, and you go to Andre 3000. they just gone better and better and better, and startling. Uh, uses of studio technology. Did you hear the Wacker Flock of Flame track, Ask Charlotte? I did. I which did. sampled, of course, Venus in Furs. Yeah, it, w it was great up to a point, but they should never have taken it off. I mean, once you get into the drone, you don't want to let go of it. I'm tired of playing with these niggas, man. Flock of Belly 1.5. Flock of Belly 1.5. Ask Charlemagne. This is public assassination because my aggravation, like fuck a graduation. Sadly, in the run-up to the inception of N Fans, your old creative foil, Lou Reed, died. And I was wondering what, if any, impact that had on the making of the album. I mean, it certainly had an effect. I mean, it was a very sad time. And kind of an inexplicable time, too. It's because I was, my first reaction was I got pissed off. I mean, I, I was just saying, when I, it really went back to drinking and um, and we both for years you know you have you have, you have a, a working relationship with a musician who understands that work is really what this is all about the work is more fun than fun when we did Drella you know the work that went into that we had no problem settling down and getting on with it and, and working all the songs out it was afterwards that then the problems came in there's all the crap that went around mm -hmm. the record so um, when, when I heard that he started drinking again, I, I got really despondent that, that he'd got lost interest in, in the work. And when that happens, you know, you feel like a, a soul brother has dropped off the world. You know, it's just like, because there's always that tie that, yeah, no matter what was going on, the work was what was important. 
quite notoriously, um, Velvet Underground weren't really part of the cultural fabric outside of the bubble you were in back in the day, but it really feels like Velvet Underground have finally become part of a greater cultural fabric. Are you used to hearing your music crop up in odd situations, like it being sampled by hip-hop artists, or like it cropping up in mainstream films? I, I haven't been paying that much attention to mainstream films that have them, although people have pointed it out to me. I think the thing about the VU was that there was such a cultural antipathy to what we were about that it really set, set the standard for, for being a pain in the ass in cultural and in musical terms because he couldn't put a finger on it. There were too many different things going on. And we did that deliberately. It's really easy for me, sat here in 2016, to look back at Velvet Underground and think, oh my God, it must have been so brilliant coming up with this kind of style of music for the first time ever and putting this stuff, you know, really violently sticking these kind of low and high things together and coming up with this sound. But for you, from the perspective of back then, how frustrating was it that it didn't seem to gain that much traction, that there seemed to be quite a lot of ignorance about it? Well, I, I didn't really expect it to have a lot of attraction. I thought we had something unique, but certain people were, were, were going to be appalled by it and, and totally disinterested in dissonance and all of that. But once we, put a, once we put a few songs together, the Black Angels, Venus, all the most parties, that had a huge sound to it, just with just us playing, I kind of thought that no one was going to be able to imitate this. The first thing was when we did uh, Heroin. We did Heroin and then Venus in Furs and the drone started coming into its own in the band. Then I knew that we, we had something that was really, that was going to last. And no one was going to be able to co uh, copy that. Shiny, shiny, shiny boots of leather When you first had the idea for the group, did you envisage it becoming a Gesamtkunstwerk or total work of art? Because it wasn't just music, was it? It was the light show, it was psychedelia, it was avant-garde filmmaking, it was avant-garde music, it was fashion, beauty, sex, drugs and rock and roll. I mean, it was the full ticket, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, and it became that really quickly and it got away from us. I mean, we got into the, so much, you can call it success, but it's, it's so much publicity, basically, that we, we didn't know how to, how to handle it. Was it inevitable after recording the second album that you were going to leave the group? There were a lot of things that went on that really pointed in that direction because, um, first of all, Lou fired Andy without telling anybody. Then he got himself a new manager, and I mean himself because Steve Sesnick who came along, he had a meeting with a band where he pronounced it, uh, this is Lou's band, you guys are sidemen. I mean, up until there, everything we did was equal. Everybody had a voice in what we were doing. And really, stylistically, he came to the point of saying, I want to do more things like Stephanie Says in the Pretty Songs uh, and not Venus in Furs, not Altamore's Parties anymore. So we had the discussion about it and I said, you know, you're going backwards with that idea. I think at the end of this year, I mean, I hand on heart, two of the most forward-looking albums will include M Fans by You and Black Star by David Bowie. Um, I was wondering, what did you what, what did you make of Black Star? Not just as an album, but obviously as a kind of a, like a testament as well. Um, it was hypnotic. It was really hypnotic. It pulled you in. It just gave you the voice, and it was great because that's all anybody wanted from David Bowie was his voice, and it was beautiful. And the videos sort of were very difficult to watch. Something happened on the day he died. Spirit rose a meter and stepped aside. Somebody else took his place and bravely cried. I'm a black star. You and David Bowie go way back. I mean, he was like when there weren't that many supporters, vocal supporters of Velvet Underground, he really was one. And he came over to spend some time with you and the band and Andy Warhol in New York. What was that visit like? 
Well, it, I mean, I ran into him because he, he was around for a Tibet concert that I was playing at. And I happened to, I, I said, you want to come and play? And he said, yeah, but I don't know what to play. Well, why don't you play viola? Because I'm doing sabotage and I, I, I play bass on this. And I taught him the little riff for the viola and he did, he just, he was fearless. It was, and then we went chasing around the mud club. So most of it was really just social interaction. A lot of drinking, a lot of ladies. So social interaction sounds like a euphemism. I know. Yeah. Let's just, just see which one of us can stand on our heads first. As soon as you kind of left VU, um, you, there was obviously this kind of putative career as um, a record producer on the cards. If you listen to Squirrel and G-Man, 24-hour party people by the Happy Mondays, and if you listen to The Marble Index by Nico, and if you listen to your version of the Stooges' debut album, you could be forgiven for thinking there's absolutely nothing in common between all of these albums. But speaking as a producer, is there a core process that you apply to everything you produce? Well, they were all kind of fly-by-night events. Studios was, were great, they were very together, they came in the studio, we had 10 days, boom, done. Um, Happy Mondays was something that happened much later, mm -hmm. when I was in a, in a much more sober frame of mind and focused on just doing what was necessary in the studio. How did, how did they say, look at you? Because you just... Oh, they so hated me, they hated me. They, they said, um, oh, he's just sitting around eating tangerines. I mean, What's that going to do with us? You know what I mean? I bet they wish they'd eaten a few more tangerines now though, eh, right? <laughs> I think so. Could you tell me about the time, how you came to decapitate a chicken in front of some punks in Croydon? Well, Croydon was famous for having the punks there do a lot of gobbing. Everybody's taking a lot of speed, drinking beer, speed, beer, speed. And then, as a form of adulation, they would like take a mouthful of beer and like throw it because it was very hot. And they thought we were doing a favor for the artist. So the, uh, Tom went up there and he got covered and drenched in this. It was like, so I thought I'm going to be in the same room. And I thought, I think I better, you know, if you think that's really great, what do you think of this? And so I chopped the chicken's head off and, and threw it out in the audience. And everybody was terrified of that chicken head. It was there on the floor in the back and people were kicking it away from it. And it was like, like a voodoo icon. What did, what did your band make of this? Well, they were all vegetarians. They didn't like it at all. They were very concerned about it from the minute that they saw the chicken come into the van on the way down to London. Um, interestingly, you recorded your mother singing down the phone to you in Welsh yes. for the original album. Why was it included in M Fans? And not in the original. At the time of the original, at the time between we made it, and, and it was a whole conversation. And... Um, I, she wasn't, she wasn't well, and I decided not to put it on the album because it's, I just thought I'd wait. And now I have this telephone conversation with her that uh, my daughter never heard her voice. And uh, she was very happy to discover it, so. I wanted to ask you about Wales. More so than a lot of countries, Wales really seems to exert a strong pull on people, especially after they've left the country. Um, how do you feel, now that you've lived in America and outside of uh, Wales for so long, how do you feel about your Welshness? So I've never thought about Wales as anything other than something to get away from. And you know, that's a really rough thing to, to, to have to rationalise to yourself. I've never been able to tell whether I've been running away from something or running into something. You spent a long period uh, in ill health as a child, and I believe you were given an opiate-based medicine for, um, um, as part of your treatment. Is there any sense in which this kind of figured in your later use of narcotics? Was it like um, a youthful look into the world of altered states and narcotic release? Yeah, it was. It was a very comfortable one. I mean, bronchitis was really was a, was a real difficult thing to handle. But I did remember that. Um, I do remember looking at the flowered wallpaper and watching it move and change. 
I don't want to be prurient, but you've mentioned the idea of running away from your own history. Would that be solely the fact that you were sexually abused when you were young? No, not a lot to do with it. Not a lot to do with it. My grandmother uh, made some rules that there was no English to be spoken in, in, the, in, the, in the house. So it was very quiet and um, any communication between me and my father was limited because I didn't speak English and he didn't speak any Welsh. Um, but, but there was this overwhelming uh, feeling that you were inadequate. Between that and the incident with the, with the organ teacher and, and the abuse there, it made me a victim. And really, one way or another, I figured out that being a victim really has repercussions all through your life. And you really do not want to be in your own mind or in anybody's mind as a victim. I think it was my mother who really framed my mind around it. She went from being a good mother to a great mother when she, she said, look, you always find someone good in somebody because everybody does have a good side that you, you're a complete person and you're not a victim. That's very important. John, thanks very much. You're welcome. Take care. Thank you.